All right. Well, what's up, guys, and welcome back to Tech Plant. Today is going to be Tech Plant's first question and answer. I've got about three pages front and back here, so I'm going to try and answer all your questions that you guys ask on both Instagram and YouTube. So, I don't have them in really any order here, so you're just going to kind of have to listen to me ramble a little bit here. But we'll just start with the first one. So the first question is, does more light really encourage more variegation in variegated plants? I'm not really 100% sure about all these things. All I do know is with variegation, you have like parts of the plant without chlorophyll. And so those parts can't create energy for the plant and they're almost kind of useless. So if it's gonna thrive and do well, if your variegated plant is gonna do very well, you're gonna need a lot more light than you would normally do because it has, let's just say like a half moon leaf, it has 50% of the chlorophyll that another leaf would normally have. So it can only produce 50% of the energy. So you're gonna have to give it a lot more light if you want it to like maintain itself. So I don't know if highlight is really gonna like create more variegation, but it will definitely give the plant the energy it needs. So I guess that's my answer to that. I would have to do some like experiments to really see if it adds more or makes the plant produce more variegation, but I'm not sure. So yeah, um, the next question is, have you ever grown your own sphagnum? If yes, how? Um, accidentally, I guess, if you make these propagation bins that I've made in the past with sphagnum moss, a lot of the stuff that you think is actually dead is quite alive. Over time, it starts to produce little like bits of growth and eventually it'll kind of fill the whole tray. So. I've grown it on accident, I guess. I do have some from carnivorous plants and that's grown pretty well and it just grows in water. So either like a really high humidity, nice wet bin will start to produce some with a good amount of light. So that's the one thing, you're gonna need a lot of light and they'll come to life. It just takes a while, so it's not gonna happen in like a week. But yeah, I've grown some myself accidentally and just from the carnivorous plants, any living stuff in there usually spreads quite well and it's just sitting in water and lots of light. It's very easy to grow. Um, next, are you ever going to sell the 3D printed moss poles? I keep teasing those things and I keep like kind of falling away from that project just due to time. I do have like my prototypes done, I would say. Um, I do want to make like the next evolution of the moss pole. I'm, I mean, every, there's a lot of people with 3D printed moss poles right now. I think mine's pretty cool because mine has a lot, a, a neater shape, but I have a better idea that I think is going to be more beneficial, but I'm going to release these pretty soon just because I want to get them out there. I want to see what people think of them, get their feedback and use that to improve. So pretty soon I should be releasing them. I'm going to use Etsy. I think that's the easiest way for people to protect themselves and myself. That way no one can scam you or anything weird from some third party site. So I'll probably make a dedicated video to that. And I'm going to at least promise you before the end of this year that I'll release those polls. So yeah, I'm going to sell them eventually. <laughs> uh, the next question is, how do you fertilize your plants? For me, I just use like a diluted fertilizer every time I water. I try not to ever go like full strength or sometimes the fertilizer like recommends you can for they have like directions for every time you water. So there's like, like two different ways you can do it. It's either like once a week and then you use like a more, like a larger dose or if you're gonna do it every watering, it's just a lesser dose. But I prefer the consistent dosage, but I'm not sure and I haven't confirmed it yet, but I feel like salts and other things start to build up in the soil from like so much fertilizer. And I think every once in a while, you should just flush your plants out with regular water, even maybe distilled water or something to get the salts if you have a water softener or just other minerals from the fertilizer that built up over time. Because I think that kind of starts to choke out the plants. And I've noticed that over time, my plants start to kind of deteriorate a little bit. And so I think flushing is important. So if you're going to do a lot of fertilization, make sure every once in a while you really flush those pots out and get all the mineral buildup out of there because it's only going to be bad for your plants after a while. Um, next, can you make a video about how to mass produce plants? The best way to mass produce plants for most of us is going to be propagation. Um, if you really want to go faster, instead of taking just one big clipping, you can always cut it up into the uh, individual nodes. That would be about the fastest method you can propagate. If you want to go even faster than that, you're going to want to do like tissue culture and like micro propagation. And that's where they kind of chop up a single node into like tiny little pieces and then they grow it in like a sterile petri dish with the perfect amount of nutrients and then those all sprout into new plants but that's not easy and it requires a lot of not i guess technical skill and there's quite a bit of equipment involved if you want to do it really well and successfully so besides tissue culture the fastest way is just keep propagating i mean it usually takes a year to get a good supply but if you just keep doing that steadily you'll get a pretty big supply i think a lot of people who try and like propagate plants to sell they sell too quickly. You know, they get 10 plants and then they're like, oh, I can sell these and make some money. 
they sell them and then they kind of start over from like one or two plants. But if you wait a year and you just keep propagating, soon you'll have a hundred plants that you can harvest from continuously instead of selling it. So I think the key is you gotta keep that stock up, that base stock before you hand them out or give them away and just keep chopping. Chopping and propping, really that's it. Um, what is your favorite plant? I've got a lot of plants I really love, but my favorite is probably Anthurium gracile. <laughs> And there's some people that really give me a lot of crap for that because it's really a generic uh, anthurium. There's nothing really that special. It's really cheap, but I like how vigorous it grows. And then once it really starts to get mature, I made a whole video about this plant, by the way. I really love it. I think it's really pretty. And as it takes over the pot, it just has these perfect, like firm spoon shaped leaves. Not really spoon shaped, but I don't know. I really love that plant. If you wanted to know about that one, you can look on my channel. I've got like a dedicated video straight for just that plant. Again, that's the Anthurium gracile. That's probably my favorite plant. I like a lot of other plants. I mean, it's my favorite, but everything else is like right behind it. So it's not like, I don't know. I just love all plants. I think they all have their like beautiful parts about them. Anyways, uh, have you ever thought about collecting orchids? Yeah, I actually have a lot of orchids. <laughs> Most of them live inside of a bin. I've killed a lot of orchids. Um, I really like the Bulbophyllum uh, genus, genus of orchids, whatever you call that. I don't even know if I pronounced it right, but they're all like, they grow like a pseudobulb with a leaf on it. And I just like the look of it. There's a ton of different varieties. The flowers are also pretty unique. They usually kind of grow in a cluster and they have just really wild appearances. I really think they're cool. And for me, I can grow those the best. They like kind of a humid, more wet condition usually. and they're just easier for me to grow. I've got a graveyard of orchids, <laughs> a shoebox full of orchid takes and like little mountings. I've killed a lot, um, but I really do like collecting orchids. They're really cool. Um, do you have any formal education on plants? I don't have any formal education at all actually, or not at all. I, I'll answer the education thing in a different question, but as far as plants, no. I've never taken any classes on plants. In fact, I... <laughs> I didn't do very well in high school and like my early college years at all. So like even like science classes, I always did well in them, but never well enough because I never did the homework. <laughs> but no, all the education that I have, I guess is just from like self experimentation. That's kind of why I make a lot of these videos. I like to actually test things out and see if it's true. You know, there's a lot of blogs out there that tell you how to take care of plants, but a lot of them are quite contradicting. And you, you, any day, and like you can make up anything these days about plants, you know, as long as you have any sort of authority, like people will kind of believe it. So I just like to test and see what happens. A lot of my propagations, I usually try different stuff, see what happens. I think the best way to learn anything is to like really experiment and try it yourself. Cause you can memorize a textbook, but you don't learn the, um, it's kind of like monkey see, monkey do. Like it's cool, you can repeat a process, but if you don't understand like why you're doing the things in that process, it's hard for you to apply that to something new and different. So I think really, if you want to learn about plants, you should definitely experiment. I think that's the best way you can do it. I know that wasn't exactly the question, but I don't know, it's a tangent. Um, what plant started it all for you? Do you still have your first plant? Uh, I think when I was really little as a child, I really loved Legos and my mother had a lot of uh, house plants and I really liked to play with the Legos and the house plants. It always, I could really like, create an imagination of like this jungle that my little Lego, Lego figurines would run around in and hang from the trees and stuff. And I always really liked those house plants. So maybe from there, that's kind of how I started to like them. Um, I think my first house plant that I actually got for myself was probably like a parlor palm. That's long gone. <laughs> I think I got that when I was like, maybe like 14, my aunt bought it for me. Cause she had a bigger one and I thought it was like the coolest thing. And so she bought me a few plants, but they're all dead. So I think, the most recent plant that I have is probably at this point seven or eight years old and I got it from my former employers when I like tore my ankle open doing some rock climbing. So I think that one is like an is Xanadu, Xanadu philodendron. Um, and then I have an aloe vera plant that's really old, maybe seven years as well. I got them around the same time. So those two are still going, but between then and now <laughs> I've killed countless of plants, so many plants and I've grown a million, not a million, but We've grown a lot of flowers for like flower beds and stuff that I've had a lot of plants in my time leading up to this channel. So yeah, there's still some alive from back in the day, but not a lot. All right, what's next? How many plants do you have? If you count seedlings, I probably have about a thousand because I've got a few hundred seedlings of different anthuriums going right now. But as far as like big, more mature plants, I've never really counted them, but I would probably think 
maybe 100, 150. Like if you count carnivorous plants, I got so many in that bin, it's unreal. So the numbers can really fluctuate depending on like what you really want to consider a plant. Because I don't know if like a cluster of plants would be considered each individual one or just one unit. I don't know how you want to quantify it, but I have a lot of plants, more than I can physically count. It would take me a while at least. All right, next question. How do you water all of your plants? Usually starts at about midnight. I go, hey honey, I'm gonna go water the plants quick. I'll be right up. And then an hour later, <laughs> after I've killed like mealybugs or aphids or whatever else I find, I've pretty much got everything watered. Usually I just have like a pump sprayer. I think they're pretty nice because you, they have like a little wand and you can really get it in there, especially if you've got a shelf full of plants. It's nice to like stick the wand in places and spray. I, I, I like that, it's, it works pretty well for me. It holds about two gallons. I probably go through maybe three gallons, but I'm gonna make a whole video about watering and everything because it really matters on like what your setup is and how you decide to water. Because I do like, I don't wanna call it micro watering. I don't even know how to describe this concept, but I don't water a ton every time. I do more frequent waterings, but less water. I find that that works pretty well for me, but the only problem is you have to be very adamant. So like every night usually or every two days, I'm kind of watering. So it's a, it's a little bit of work, but it seems to work better for me. I don't know. I have less killings from overwaterings that way. Um, and I, again, I'll make a video about, over, or about watering in general and how to do it and how to really apply watering to your setup because there is really no good advice for watering unless you really understand your own setup or if the person offering advice really knows like what your setup is because you can say, oh yeah, this aloe vera only needs to be watered like every two weeks. But if you have it in a low light area, you don't have to water that thing for two months, honestly. If it's not getting a lot of sunlight or even a lot of artificial light, it can go forever without water. But if it's in a south facing window in the sun, you might need to water it once a week, even more. It depends on how much light things really get. So again, that's for a whole video. I could probably talk for an hour about all the different scenarios that affect watering. So again, wait for that. That'll be a lot better than just listening to what I said now. But anyways, Next question, uh, are we gonna finish the whole Greek al alphabet before this pandemic ends? I have no idea, it seems to keep going. I thought this would, it ruined my wedding, it ruined our honeymoon, it's, well actually it's been pretty cool. The pandemic, I, other than obviously the death, like it's, it's a very serious thing and it's a terrible thing. But for me, it's really been great for my family. I've been home this whole time with my wife, my newborn son, so I really, Honestly, I'm thankful for the, at least work from home stuff. It's given me a lot of time with my wife and my child and I, I'm i eternally grateful for that time because I'll never get that back. And if I was in the office, I would miss so many moments with my kid. I really love the fact that I'm home with my kid and I can just hug him whenever I want. So at least for me, the pandemic's been pretty nice. Most of my family has been pretty healthy, but for those who lost people, I know it's a terrible thing. So I don't want to make light of the pandemic, but for me, it's it's been okay. And I don't know when this is gonna end, honestly. I thought it would have ended a long time ago, but who knows? So that's a question I can't possibly answer. Um, next question. Do you have a personal Instagram account? I do, I don't really use it. It's only ever been like travel pictures. So it, I don't know, it's pretty much a useless one. I use the tech plant Instagram mostly. So if you're gonna follow anything, it would be the, like my personal one, you'll literally never see anything new. <laughs> so it's pointless for me to even like announce it because there's nothing good there. So just the tech plant one's the better one. That's probably more my personal one anyways. Um, next, uh, next question. How do you plan for a video? Uh, most of the videos that I do are just me recording like a process I wanna try or like a new plant I wanna try growing. Um, I guess half of the videos are like me just presenting something to you or showing you something. So those are pretty easy to plan. Honestly, I don't really plan anything. It's just, I just kind of do it. So like if I'm doing a how to grow this, I just attempt to grow it and I see what works. That's really it, I guess. The hardest part is coming up with new ideas. But as far as planning, I mean, most of it kind of plans itself because if I want to do a propagation experiment, well, obviously I have to do the start and then I just do some updates and then there's a conclusion where I repot it or show that like it succeeded. So luckily most of my content, as long as I can come up with the idea first, it kind of plans itself. And so I just film everything. And then once I've, I'm satisfied with the amount of time that's passed or like the results, then I'll just go voice it over and release it. So the planning is actually quite easy. The harder part is coming up with the idea. And the hardest part is sticking to something. There are so many videos that have never seen the light of day because like something happened where I was too busy for a week or I couldn't do take care of it well and it died, you know, or I did something wrong and I killed it. So obviously like <laughs> that's not the way to do it. So I'm not gonna make a video about it because I did it wrong, right? Um, 
So that's probably the hardest part of staying like adamant and keeping up with it and actually getting those intervals of time. I know in some of my videos, all of a sudden it goes from like every two weeks to a month, sometimes even two months. Like it's tough to keep going with that stuff. It's hard to like keep it all like under control if just random life things happen, especially this past couple of years because it's been like getting married, buying a house, having a kid. Like, I don't know, it's been chaotic, but things are starting to get a little easier now, so there should be more consistent videos, but yeah, that, I guess that answers that. Um, what else we got here? What is your favorite propagation method? Personally, I do like propagation bins. I mean, they're really easy to get things going. They have a high success rate. Um, something I don't like about them is getting them out of the bin sometimes isn't the easiest. Sometimes there's quite a shock and you have to like really acclimate them to the regular climate. Not always, but sometimes, and you might lose those early leaves. Or I've noticed like some of the times the plants will get almost like, they start to hit their limit of being in the bin and they start to slowly look worse and worse. They still grow, but they don't look good. But for me, the propagation bin with sphagnum moss, honestly, I have the most success with. I rarely see a failure in there, so I do like at least getting things established, rooted, and growing in a propagation bin. I've made videos about it in the past, so you can look those up if you want more information. But for me, that's the best. And if you don't have sphagnum moss, because I know some countries can't get a hold of it easily or it's really expensive, perlite works too. I've been using a lot of that as well. I'm trying to experiment with different things. So there are alternatives. But yeah, that's the best method for me. Everything else seems to be like iffy. So yeah. Um, how did you become so involved with plants? I talked earlier about how my mother had some house plants and I really love them and I just really like the outdoors. I like plants. I think they're beautiful, like any kind. And I just think um, the way they grow and everything's just amazing. And I, the idea that you can like take care of it and do things with it is just cool. I, I like the idea that you can multiply them. There's like so many factors with plants that you can do. You can breed them and they're all kind of risk-free. Like I know a lot of people like to do that with animals, but like I said, sometimes my experiments die. So if I was doing this with like actual living creatures, like pets and stuff, like I would probably be killing pets. So <laughs> plants it is, you know, plants are a lot easier. And if you make a mistake, it's more forgiving. You know, you can cut it back, propagate it. So I think plants are just a really interesting hobby to explore there. Like I said, there's a lot of facets. They're beautiful. There's such variety. You can collect so many different varieties and every day you can discover a new beautiful plant. I mean, you could think you know a lot about plants and a lot about aeroids or this or this species. And then suddenly you like learn about an entire new genius that you never knew existed. And they're filled with beautiful plants. And I just think the variety and just like the utter like awe and like width and everything of like plants in general is just really pretty. And I guess it just draws me into it. And I just, I like growing them. I think it's, I don't know. It's just a really cool thing and they're very beautiful. Um, most recommended fertilizer. I haven't used that many fertilizers, so I hate to recommend stuff if I don't have like a vast like knowledge of different types to try, but lately I've been using stuff by, like Dynagro and I use Maxi. I, I usually like fertilizers that aren't that intense and I usually dilute them. I find that it's a little easier for me not to kill something, yet they still get some decent amount of nutrients. So those are the two that I like, but that's not like the go-to, like these are the only ones that work. Cause again, I've only really tried to, so I can't tell you how amazing they really are. I just know for me, they seem to work. So I don't want to say like, oh, these are the ones you gotta get. I mean, you might have different opinions and if you find one that works for you, I would use that one too. But I've had good success with Maxi and Dynagro is something I've been using lately and it seems to be working. So I don't know. Uh, what other hobbies do I have? Um, uh, quite a bit. I mean, obviously photography and videography have been a hobby of mine for a long time, which allowed me to kind of get the YouTube thing going. I love 3D printing. I think it's a really awesome thing to be into and explore. It has so many awesome aspects to it and you can really apply it to many things. Like I'm applying to the channel. I've got a lot of 3D printed stuff and it's just really cool. Um, I like archery a lot. I've done it for most of my life. So it's a lot of fun. Guns are a lot of fun. I like going to the range with my father, hunting, fishing. I mean, I've got a lot of hobbies. I like trying new, new things. And in the past, I've gotten into like rock climbing, like like seriously, and just, I'm a person that really like gets obsessed with a hobby and just goes ham. So, and as you can see with the plants, like it's almost ridiculous. But like I said, if I get into something, like I've got it or like explore it a lot. So I don't know, I've got too many hobbies and not enough time, but I think that's most people's problem. Uh, have you tried, tree fern as a substrate. Not yet. I've seen a lot of people really love it, but it's like $50 for like a bag like this big. So <laughs> I don't know if I really want to try it because if I like it, I'm going to be broke. So I'm staying away from it. Sphagnum moss is doing it for me and a lot of other stuff. So I'm 
I'll try it eventually, but again, that's not something I want to have a good experience with because then it's going to be a lot of money. So I'm just avoiding it. Um, when do you plan on launching your store? That's another thing that's quite difficult. Uh, I'm finding that if you really want to, if I'm going to launch a plant store, it's going to be like small batches and I don't know. I'm still working through that whole thing. Definitely the 3d printing stuff will come out soon, but selling plants, it's just going to be tough for me right now to really produce a lot. I have a lot of seedlings going the Melano chrism I've got going like crazy. So I'm trying to get to that point, but unless I have a big stock, I can't possibly please a lot of people. And it's just going to be kind of like, Oh, I'm sold out. And now you have to wait another year. So I'm, I know I keep telling you guys, I'm going to sell, I'm going to sell. And I keep putting it off, but I'm trying to like do it correctly. And it's just tough to get to that point with like the setup I have. So eventually I'll have something, I'll sell some plants, but it's going to be a little bit yet. Look forward to more like 3D printing stuff or like things to assist plants. I'm kind of looking in that direction because it's much easier for me to produce. All right, we just finished page one. So this is already way too long. Oof. Uh, I'm going to lose like everybody on the first two minutes. <laughs> Uh, here's another question. Any exact time you're going to sell the Milano, those will probably be sold sooner than everything else. Because like I said, I've got a lot of established plants now. I'm going to do another big cut and propagate. So I should be having like a solid stock so I can actually like give it to more than 10 people. You know, I want to be able to release like 25 every month, something consistent, maybe 30 a month. I don't know. I just, I don't want it to be like where 10 people get the plant and everyone's kind of like, Oh, I really wish I had that plant. Luckily for you guys, the price is coming down anyways in the hobby. Like they're not that expensive anymore, but I'll still try and beat their prices. Cause I don't, it's like a girl's almost like a weed to some extent. It's pretty quick. Like I think the prices are pretty expensive, but now they're getting a little more realistic. So if you can't wait for mine, there are alternatives out there that are pretty cheap. So there's that. Um, another question, does lower light equal darker leaves? I'm not sure. I mean, I guess does chlorophyll make leaves darker? That would be the question I would ask. Cause I would imagine similar to the variegated question in the very beginning. If it's in very low light, it's going to need to maximize its chlorophyll. So that way it can absorb like every bit of light possible. So if chlorophyll does indeed make leaves darker, I don't know if the, like the higher the concentration of chlorophyll, the darker the leaf. Again, I'm, I'm not really sure about that. I never looked into it, but if that is the case, then I would say probably it'd probably make the leaves darker if they're because the leaves are going to have to have a lot more chlorophyll to get enough energy from that low light. So that would be my idea behind it. But again, I'm just some guy in a basement growing plants. Like, what do I know? So you can experiment. I mean, get two or three of the same plants and see what you can find out. You can put one in a windowsill and one off to the right. And after two or three months, if you see a change in color, I guess there's your answer, right? So maybe I'll do a video about that because that's pretty interesting. Um, have you ever tried growing Venus fly traps? Yeah, I've had a few cultivars. Um, I've killed them. I've had like two or three actually, and they've dried out. I actually lost a few different carnivorous plants due to them drying out when I moved into this new house. Again, things are chaotic. I, it's not really a good excuse, but I did kill them sadly, but they are awesome. And if you guys don't know this, a lot of you have probably seen Venus fly traps like in the store in those little cups that are usually half dead and rotted, but there are so many Venus fly trap cultivars and there are some real beauties and just really oddball looking ones. So there are so many cool Venus fly traps out there. You got to look them up. Honestly, if you don't know about them, take a look, right? Maybe don't because ignorance is bliss. And if you don't know about them, you don't want to have them. So maybe don't look it up, but if you're curious, they're really cool. Um, what's your favorite color? I like purple. I like gray. I mean, this is back. This background's gray. I just, I don't know. I, those are my favorite colors, gray and purple. I think another person asked boxers or briefs. I prefer boxers. I don't like feeling constricted or anything. So boxers are nice. Next question. Is your wife interested in plants too? Has she ever bought you a plant? Um, she likes plants. Definitely not to, I feel like I'm kind of an extremist in most aspects of my life. So it's hard to say like, uh, compared to me, maybe not as much, but she likes plants. She enjoys them in the house. She at least shows interest in all my plants. Maybe she just loves me enough to pretend she likes it, but I think she likes plants and she's bought me some plants in the past. She usually gets me gift cards for like greenhouses so I can get a plant without really considering the cost. So that's pretty cool too. She's very good to me and she is very nice about all the plants and stuff. So yeah, I think she likes them. Um, if you taught a plant class to little kids in school, what would my class be like? I think it's kind of hard for me to think of exactly what I would do with them, but I would really want to teach them the beauty of plants and how to find beauty in even like generic plants. You know, a lot of the like plant culture now is like seeking out these like very like rare things and just ignoring the rest. Like the rest are just stupid, ugly plants. But I think even simple things like pothos can be beautiful. So I think I would want to teach them to look at every plant and then find like the beautiful aspects about those plants because everything has its own type of beauty, you know? So I think that's what I'd focus on. I think once you see the beauty in plants, it brings you in more. 
And so maybe the kids would be encouraged more to get into it, I guess. I don't know. But I would also try and teach them like the growing your own food aspect. I think that's like a whole nother thing that I would love to do with this channel. And it's very important. I mean, when you look at the current like food production industry, like there's like three companies that like own all of it. So I think it's very risky and I don't trust anything. So I don't trust like what's in the food that we eat at this point. So I think growing your own food is like crucial and I think it could help a lot of people. You can grow an awful lot of food in the summer with a very small spot. So I think that's what I'd focus on. Finding the beauty in plants because I think once you find that, you have a genuine interest and passion and teaching them about the food aspects and how important it is. Um, what's next? Favorite Christmas movie? Um, I guess I never thought about that. I do like Home Alone movies. I'm not sure if those are even Christmas movies, but I always liked the contraptions that the kid would build, like all the little traps and stuff. Except for that nail scene. I can't stand that nail scene. Ugh. Every time I see it, even as a kid, I just cringe. It just bothers me. Um, would you ever start a business, plant related or not? I do have an LLC now for tech plant because I do want to start selling um, the moss poles and stuff. And like I said, I want to get into like plant care and items to help people care for plants because it's hard to keep up with the plant market as just one guy in a basement. But plant care is something that can help like everybody. So even if I don't have the plant you like, I can at least like assist with like cool things to help people care for plants. I like, I'm starting to transition into liking that idea instead of so much selling plants. It's kind of hard for a, like a small person to do a lot. So I like, I think that's where I'm kind of headed towards if it, if I'm gonna like talk about the actual business side of things is plant care. I like that idea the most. Um, the biggest plant purchase regret. I don't think I've ever regretted purchasing things. My biggest plant regret, I'm gonna take out the purchasing because I've never regretted purchasing a plant. Um, honestly, once I purchase a plant and it dies, for whatever reason, like the monetary value of it didn't, doesn't, I don't care about that. So if it dies, it just, I'm kind of sad I lost the plant. But like, I've had like a hundred dollar in theory and that I just like could not um, climatize to my thing and it died quickly. So I was just like, well, there it goes. So I, I don't have regrets of, as far as purchases. My biggest regret is like being lazy and losing a plant because I was lazy. That's probably my biggest plant regret, you know? But I don't regret buying them. I like everything I buy usually. And I don't know, I, I guess that's the only way I can answer that question. Before I get to this next question, it's already been almost a half an hour. And if you're still here, thank you very much. I appreciate your interest in this video, but holy cats, this is by far the longest tech plant video I think we've ever produced. Um, sorry, I'm, I guess, talking too much, but let's go to the next question. If you had 500 to spend on only plants or only plant accessories, what would it be? Uh, probably plant accessories. I'm getting to a point now where I have a lot of plants and adding more to the collection doesn't really help my situation. It's more like just adding to things I have to care for and I'm pretty content with what I have. So I would love to just spend 500 bucks on like substrates. Like it would be nice to get more sphagnum moss, orchid bark, you know, big bags of perlite, pots. You know, I, if you've seen a lot of my videos, they're still all in like, <laughs> like plastic nursery pots because that's the cheapest thing that I can buy and it's not very heavy. But I would like to put some of my like prized, not prized plants, but my favorite plants or like the really large specimens in nice pots for once, you know? Um, so I think I'd spend $500 on like plant care, you know, poles, like th just things to improve my plants overall health because I can keep piling more plants in here, but I'm just gonna lose them if I don't take good care of them. So by $500, definitely gonna be plant care stuff. I think that's a good investment at this point. I got enough plants, I think. Um, next, uh, what music do I listen to? Honestly, pretty much everything. You know, I can listen to, I'm not even going to go into it because <laughs> literally anything, like K-pop, uh, like R&B, jazz, uh, future funk, uh, classical music. Like I literally listen to anything and usually it's on YouTube. So I'm sure I listen to half the stuff that gets recommended to you guys too. So it's really just anything. I don't have a preference and I can find enjoyment in any song really. Uh, will plants continue to grow in winter with artificial lighting and humidity? Yeah, I mean, if you want your plants to grow well in the winter, I would definitely suggest artificial lighting. Most people's houses actually get pretty dry, so you're gonna have to find a way to bump up that humidity depending on what plants you have. Obviously, if you've got succ succulents, you don't really have to worry about humidity too much, but um, that's something I struggle with in the winter too. Everything that I'm growing now is in my basement, so I'm completely artificial light. I have a heater, in fact, because the basement gets quite cold in the winter, so I have a heater. Um, the humidity thing, I just try and like spray water everywhere. So there's just water sitting. <laughs> there's just water on the floor sitting there, so that way like as it evaporates, it adds to the humidity. It's not the safest thing. It's probably not good for the concrete floor, maybe. I don't know, but 
whatever I can do to get that humidity up. I don't know about people in bedrooms because it's not like you can saturate the carpet. That's not a good idea. But yeah, if you can keep the humidity up and artificial lighting, they'll keep growing great. I mean, a lot of tropical plants, they don't have too much of a like dormancy period, you know, and it depends on, I guess, where they're from. But if they're close to the equator, I mean, these things are just cruising, they're just growing. So you don't necessarily have to give them a dormancy period. However, there are some plants that actually do well with dormancy. So it's really gonna be plant dependent. And that, I guess, is for you to kind of figure out about each one of your plants. But I just crank the light on 24, or not 24 seven, but throughout the whole year, I'm using artificial light. So yeah, next. Um, have you ever thought about streaming? Actually, I do wanna do plant streams. I think like general plant chores and care would be sort of interesting and people could maybe ask questions like while well, I'm doing something. I just, I don't know if it's like worth the efforts if it's like, uh, cause like even with my channel now, if there's a task I want to get done and I have to film it, it doubles the time, if not more. That's the only thing I don't like about my YouTube channel is it can sometimes interfere with just getting things done. You know, if I have to do something with a plant, sometimes I put it off cause oh, I got to drag out the camera, get things set up and it takes a lot of effort and it can sometimes like prevent me from doing like the care that needs to be done. Now I'm sort of starting to get things more permanently set up in this basement because I have a little more space. So it's getting a little easier, but like streaming, I have to find a nice streamlined way. And if people aren't showing up to watch it, then I don't know if it's worth it. So if you guys think I should stream and there would be a decent amount of people interested in it, then I would probably try doing it. If I can interact with you guys, I think that'd be cool. Uh, that's probably one of my favorite parts about the YouTube channel is just interacting with people. I like the comment section. I try and answer most stuff lately. I'm missing a lot, but if you've looked in the comment sections, I respond to a lot of stuff, especially right away when a video comes out, I'm usually pretty responsive. I try my best, but again, there's so many videos with so many comments coming in that it's tough to like keep up. But if I don't ignore you, it's not on purpose, just keep commenting, I guess. Eventually I'll see one and I'll get to it. But yeah, I mean, if you guys want me to stream, I can try doing that and we can figure something out. But again, there has to be some a decent amount of interest. So in the comments, you can leave that if you're interested and maybe we'll get something going. Um, what made me start filming plant content on YouTube? Honestly, it started with a like Raspberry Pi video, which is like an electronic device. I couldn't find anyone who had a video tutorial on how to do it. I'm not like an electrical engineer. I'm not very good with that stuff. So I usually need to watch somebody else do it so I can understand what I need to do to complete the task I want to complete. Notice no one had an, uh, a, a tutorial for it. So I made one because I have a lot of camera equipment from just doing this as a side hobby, like just taking pictures and video for fun. So I made a video, it did well. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. You know, this is fun. Like there's views, you know? And so then I made the avocado video, people like that. So I was like, oh, this is a lot of fun, you know? And so then it just progressively got bigger. Like I said, I people comment on those videos, you know, and they're, they share cool stories. Like a lot of times I'll get someone who will say um, like, Oh, you know, I, this plant, I had this plant from my grandma. It's 50 years old or like they have like these cool family stories that they share or people just share really cool stories in the comment section. I don't know if you guys ever read them, but there's really cool stuff. People always share cool things, tips. Like I said, I'm just some guy in a basement. Like there's nothing special about me. I don't know everything about plants. I make a lot of mistakes. I kill a lot of plants, but there's other people out there who have more expertise in a certain plant or they have tips in, in the comment section. They will offer their tips. Sometimes it's contradictory to what I have to say and it's cause it works for them. So that like, I love that. Like, I think it's really cool to hear other people's perspectives. And like I said, I really like the stories about like the family stuff. Like they'll be like, oh, my grandmother gave me this cutting like 20 years ago or like, I don't know. It's, it, I can't think of all the examples because of whatever reason, but it's cool. I, I like the interaction. It's a lot of fun. Same with Instagram. I sometimes accidentally snub people, but for the most part, I try and answer and talk to everybody that talks to me on Instagram. I've never like locked the DMs or anything because it's fun to talk to you guys. I like to hear what you guys have to say. If you have questions, I like to be helpful. So I think um, the YouTube thing is like a lot of it's the social aspect. It's a lot of fun. And the other thing too is I use the macro lens a lot and you know, a lot of times you see your plant on a shelf. I'm sorry, this is all long winded stuff and this is gonna be like an hour long video, but I got a lot to say, okay? Um, what I love is you have your plant and it sits there and it looks pretty, but it's not often that you really get to see it up close, you know? And I love filming everything and getting some like macro shots. And then when I look at it, the computer, it's like, I get to see a whole nother side of this plant. There's things I didn't notice, you know, with the Anthurium gracile, my, one of my favorite plants, I didn't realize the detail in which like the red speckled stem like had, like these aren't things that I always see just from the naked eye or just notice that much. But when you take the time to like film the plant or film something, you can really like explore and see it. You can, I don't know, I, I like that aspect as well. The social side is really cool, I, it's fantastic. But I love like the exploratory side and um, 
knowing that other people might benefit from the videos too, like encourages me to want to produce these experiments, right? Like obviously I can produce them for myself, but how cool is it that other people can either see what I've done or it can improve on it, you know, offer suggestions and just the idea that to help people is cool. I, I, like I said, the social thing, the exploratory thing, I think all that together, it makes it a lot of fun to make YouTube videos. So I like that. Sorry, it's pretty long winded. Um, how do you keep mold out of your human setups? I also find mold even when circulated. You know, honestly, I don't know. I sometimes get mold in my, I don't know if it's really mold or algae. I mean, I think a lot of people, even I don't know the difference between half of the things growing in there, but there's like mold, algae, funguses. There's all kinds of different things that can be growing in there. A lot of it can be beneficial in my opinion. It's doing things to break things down and helping. In my prop bins, there's all kinds of wacky stuff growing in there. But I've noticed that as long as the nodes are pretty healthy from the get go, they don't like just rot away because of like some moldy thing over on the left corner. So for the most part, none of it really bothers the things in there. But if it's super excessive, I don't honestly know what to tell you. I haven't experienced that. So I can't really give you recommend honest recommendations because I haven't experienced like excessive amounts. So I don't know, I guess, like you said, the question says like they even get it in their circuit air circulated thing. So Maybe it's algae. I mean, maybe try and identify it. Maybe it is mold. I don't know. So I, I'm sorry. I don't really have any good explanation for how to really prevent it. I know air circulation helps keep the nasty stuff out. Usually I think there's like anaerobic, anaerobic bacteria. I think the anaerobic one is the one you don't want, but I guess that's about as much as I can tell you about that. Uh, what's your favorite Monstera? I honestly really love the Oblica. I know that's kind of a meme at this point. Um, but I like the like the frailness to it, and I just find like uh, it's hard to describe. But the beauty of like the frailness of this leaf is just so like I don't know. I just find it it's so beautiful. It's so frail and like fragile looking, yet it's like pronounced. I I don't know. I just love it. It's really cool. Even though like, it's like the meme of the century at this point, but it's really cool. And luckily for everybody else, the pricing has gone so far down. I mean, they used to be thousands of dollars. Now you can get a node for like a hundred bucks, sometimes under a hundred dollars. And since there's so many people growing it, soon they're gonna be worth nothing. So you'll be able to get your hands on such a beautiful plant. And it hasn't been too hard of a plant to grow. So I don't know. I have mine out of the bin now and the newest leaf seems to be doing okay in low humidity. So we'll see. But that's my favorite Monstera for sure. Um, what Monstera, and before I get to the next question, the other favorite is just the common Delicioso. I think it's just a pretty plant. It gets nice and big. It, as it matures, it changes dramatically. I think it's another great plant too, and I, I have multiples and I love them. So I like those two, but favorite Oblica for sure. Um, what Monstera do you recommend? I would recommend the Deliciosa. It's so easy to grow in my opinion. It doesn't need a lot of watering. It can tolerate pretty dry times and it can just become so big and beautiful. It really can get such awesome fenestrated leaves. And it's just a really like, mm, like I don't know how to describe it, but it's big, it's a, I don't know. I recommend it. It's great. I love it. It's cool. I think it's a good one for most people to get. It's an easy one to start with. And from there you can like stretch your fingers out and try different, different uh, varieties of Monstera. But that's definitely the one I recommend. Delicioso, easy, cool, gets big. It's beautiful. I love it. Okay. Next question. We just got done with the first page by the way. So <laughs> I'm going to try and go faster, but these questions go quicker. Um, what type of soil do you use for your mango tree? Is it sandy mix or heavy mix? That thing is long deceased. Um, when I went to Korea a while back, it died. My parents were taking care of things and it just did not make it. I think I just had it in regular potting soil, so I wasn't taking the best care of it, I guess. I, I don't know. I don't even remember what it is at this point. That was early on in my like plant growing career. I think this was, what, three, four years ago? So I'm not sure. There are some good guides out there. There's a lot of people that grow them commercially, so I'm sure through like forums or something you could find better information than what I have, because mine's dead. So you don't want to take my advice. Um, <laughs> This is another one. Yeah, I've got a question. Why the hell don't mites ever stop and how do I get them to stop? Uh, spider mites have been the bane of my, well, every pest has pretty much been the bane of my existence. I use neem oil a lot. Uh, most pests, really, if you're just very adamant and you really stick to a, re like a regime, you can get rid of them. I physically remove a lot with my thumb. I mean, I go through and just scrape them away. That kills a lot of them. It takes care of quite a bit, but neem oil works. Just remember to do it at night before you don't want the lights to be on it because it can burn your plants. Um, I'm gonna try systemic pretty soon here. So that's a kind of a poison that the plants uptake and anything that bites it dies. So I'm thinking that'll be a little better. But yeah, I mean, with most pests, you just have to be very adamant. Um, 
and you got to stick to a plan and just keep doing it every day and you can't get lazy because if you get lazy then they come back full force and honestly it's kind of like when you collect 200 something plants you're you're going to have problems it's hard to keep up with everything it's just not i've just accepted pests at this point it's just i don't have a lot you know like i might find like five spider mites on a plant today if i look at one you know or like one of all the plants might have some spider mites I, that's just something i accept at this point that i haven't they've never gotten big enough now that i'm taking care of them well enough to like kill anything or like really expand so i just keep them in check i think when you have huge collections unless you're gonna use strong chemicals or systemics you just got to keep them in check you know that's all you can really do um this is oddly specific but if you were propagating a top cutting of a philodendron with several nodes would you separate the nodes and propagate each individually or prop it as one long stick with new growth at the top i think it depends on what you're going for are you trying to mass produce because if you want to mass produce every single node if you want more you know what i mean or if you want to like plant them together it depends on the airway and make them like more bushy like a more bushy pot with multiple growths coming out then maybe every every node but if you want to kind of maintain the maturity and this is still um not confirmed by me at least i'm kind of noticing this as time is going on but if you leave the like a bigger chunk it seems to want to stay more mature i notice if you do single node cuttings almost always you're going to get a very immature leaf but anything that have like two or three nodes wherever it grows out of it seems to be doing okay and if it's a top cutting it should continue on its merry way so it depends are you just trying to cut it because it's got too big and you want to keep it going or are you trying to multiply if you're trying to multiply individual if you want to keep it nice and big i would leave a few nodes on one piece i think that does the best all right next up not not really a planty question but i'm fairly new plant parent and binge so many of your videos over the last few months i noticed you have a connection to south korea i've seen you wear t-shirts with hangul you once mentioned being away from your plants because you're in south korea for several months and you also recently posted a foodie photo pic on ig it was like korean food um i'm not sure if you ever talked about it before and i'm curious to know about this i've been passively learning korean over the last year or so and i'd love randomly coming across others that are also interested in the culture this is quite a long story i'll save this one for the end because it's not plant related at all like they i mean that's what they said but if you're interested all right so the, the memory card ran out right before i finished that but the whole korean thing i'll explain at the end um it's not really plant related but it's i guess it's a pretty interesting story so and it's really shaped my life quite a bit so i'll talk about that at, at the end so let's skip on to the next question will repotting a plant while it is unfurling leaves mess up or affect their growth you know i haven't done that very often but i from the few times that I have, it doesn't seem to be that good for the plant. I think it kind of messes it up, but I don't know if unfurling necessary is gonna be a problem. If it's already like kind of open, I think you're okay. But if it's still like a tight bundle and it's doing its thing, sometimes they like wanna rot away almost for me. I notice like they, I don't know what it is, but they get a little funky on me. So I think you're safe after it's kind of opened a little bit, but ugh, I would just try and wait. Honestly, if you can wait, or honestly, other, uh, I shouldn't keep saying honestly because I could say that a million times. Um, for me, I can accept like damage to my plant. I know it's not going to die from that. I know it's going to keep growing. So it's kind of up to you. I mean, are you trying to grow the most perfect specimen ever? Then maybe wait. But if you don't mind too much and you just, it's a task that needs to get done, it's going to grow another leaf. You're going to get another pretty leaf. Eventually, you'll never even know that that leaf that failed was even there because the plants are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger, right? I mean, the first like 10 leaves of a year old plant don't even exist anymore. Usually, oh, I shouldn't say that. But you get what I'm trying to say. Like, it's kind of up to you. If, if it gets damaged, eh, is it a big deal? I don't know. It's up to you. So I would just hold off. I don't think it's worth risking it if you don't want to risk it. But I don't think it's that big of a deal. But again, I'm not an expert on that. I don't have a lot of experience with that. So take what I said with a grain of salt. Um, do you have any pest management routine for your plants? Um, what do you use? I know you grow them indoors, so is there less chance of getting infestation in indoor setting, maybe fungal infection here or there? I don't think I've ever witnessed a true fungal infection, but I don't know, I'm not an expert, and they're usually pretty hard to identify because sometimes overwatering or underwatering can look the same. You get those same like yellow spots, so I don't know. It's hard to say about fungal stuff, but indoors actually is probably worse than outdoors for pests because outdoors, the pests have their own pests that deal with them. So like there's like a balance outside for the most part. Sometimes you can get a big clump of something terrible, but I think indoors is harder because they can spread quick without any interruption. There's nothing eating them. They just spread. So 
I kind of talked about it earlier. I use a lot of manual killing, um, alcohol Q-tips for mealy bugs if they're in like really tight nooks and crannies because you can really, the alcohol can just kind of zap them in there. Oh, that's just my thumb. Like I have aphids suddenly. On a lot of my Ethereum seeds, there's a ton of aphids. I think they're coming from my fish tank. I'm not sure, but I'm just killing them by hand. Just squishing them. You know, that seems to do a lot. And then a little bit of neem oil. And again, I'm going to switch to a systemic pretty soon here. And that like makes the plant poisonous. So anything that bites it dies basically. Not anything, but certain pests that bite it die. So I'm hoping that helps me really eliminate the pest problem. My biggest thing I would suggest is quarantining, quarantine, quarantining plants properly. But once your collection gets so big, it's pests are just something you live with. You learn to live with them and keep them at bay, I guess, or you get a systemic. So there's a lot of information about it. I've just been manually taking care of this stuff, but I have pests. Like my collection has pests. There's mealybugs on stuff as we speak. Definitely some spider mites. Now, granted, there's only a few in the whole collection, but they they exist. You know, I haven't gotten rid of them completely. Um, it's pretty hard unless you have a lot of time to dedicate to it, but be very rigorous, be very exact, and don't get lazy because you can eradicate them. It just takes consistency, you know, because they got to understand their lifespan. Certain ones like the eggs don't hatch for 20 days. So if you get rid of the adults in 20 days or around that window, you better start looking for the babies because like that's what happens to most people. You treat the pests, no, no pests for a little bit. It seems like, hey, I killed them all. But then the eggs hatch, you know, or some dormant thing comes out of nowhere and here they are again, because you forget to look for them. So be diligent with looking when you're watering your plants, look at them. Usually if you see some spots on the leaves, there's a good chance you got some pests on the other side chomping at, chomping away. So just be diligent and you shouldn't have too much of a problem. But once you hit a certain amount of plants, it just becomes something you live with. So I, I don't mind them too much anymore, but yeah, that's just me. Um, what's next? Uh, how to transfer from sphagnum moss to soil? Are all your plants in hydro? Is conversion difficult? How do you fight thrips and spider mites? I kind of talked about those thrips and spider mites. I think if you're really gonna fight these things super effectively, systemic, it's, I mean, it kills them when they bite it. It's the easiest way than applicating because even neem oil sometimes doesn't get them. So, um, but back to the sphagnum moss stuff, I just transfer them and I keep the soil a little bit damp. I try not to let it dry out right away and they seem to do okay. But again, you don't want to like overwater them. So it, the whole watering and transferring thing is all related. Again, I'm going to make a dedicated video, but it's going to be a long video. So it's going to be tough to make. But are all your, uh, let's get back to the question. Are all your plants in hydro? Um, Not really. I've grown a few in LECA. It seems to work pretty well. I don't know. I just haven't. I've got a whole like 50 liter bag upstairs. I should probably start doing more. Just haven't gotten around to it. So I think that answers that. Tips on red flags from sellers on eBay, Etsy, Facebook. For example, I'm in the market for an album on there and some listings look real rough, but are still full price. Doesn't have to be related to the plant though. I'm gonna say this, if it looks too good to be true, it's a scam. I mean, it's really rare that you're gonna get this really amazing deal from a random person. From a friend, yes, you'll probably get, you can get a nice deal, but there's very few strangers that truly wanna help somebody. For me, I've bought a lot of plants from people on Facebook. Um, it takes time. I mean, once I meet one person, they introduce me to other people. Like. It's best if you can buy from someone that someone else has already bought from and kind of verify it from there. If someone messages you offering you plants, that's a huge red flag. There are, I've never seen it like a legitimate person like trying to sell plants to people like basically door to door through Facebook. If they're messaging you like, oh, do you want this plant? Do you want this plant? Like it's probably a red flag because they're like trying to find someone to accept. So definitely shy away from that unless you can confirm their identity from somebody else. That's the biggest tip for me. Confirm that they're legitimate through someone else that is legitimate in the community. If you go in these cell groups, there's some like kind of like star figures that are always posting stuff. And usually I just personally message them like, hey, have you ever bought from this person? Or like, what do you know about this person? Always verify because there's a lot of scams out there. And the other thing, some people are going to get angry when I say this, but hear me out. If their English is really weird, there's a lot of like foreign scammers out there at this point. And I don't say, I'm not saying bad English. There's a lot of people with bad English. If you've ever seen my comment replies, my English is horrible. But the scammers, they're trying so hard to appear legitimate that they find weird vocabulary. I don't even know how to describe this, but their vocabulary is like, it's so weird. You'll, you'll if you ever see it, you'll know what I mean. Like they, they pick the most peculiar way to like, try and seem legitimate. You know, they're, they're like trying so hard to sound like a native speaker that it comes out the weirdest thing. Whereas people who maybe are English second language, they'll have like spelling mistakes or grammatical errors, but they're not gonna 
throw out these like strange large vocabulary that that's a big red flag really strange vocabulary is the number one like just back off they're <laughs> they're not legitimate there's no way because people trying to sell you a plant are not trying to like impress you with their vocabulary skills someone who has english second language they're just gonna have typos and maybe like a few grammar mistakes and those people are usually legitimate because it's just like the message is the same it's just there's a few little errors and i make more errors than anybody else i mean my wife is her english she's english second language and her english is better than mine is at least like written half the time so it's the weird vocabulary that is the key weird vocabulary is a red flag I, <laughs> I you'll see it one day and you'll know what i'm talking about next question how are the lemon trees doing they're dead i'm sorry um they just they're deceased at this point R rest in peace um what do you think will be the next plant trend uh i think a lot of hybrids that is going to be the next trend this is this is personally my opinion but when i see the anthurium sales now i'm, I'm pretty in the anthuriums i like them but everyone and their mother is growing anthurium right now. Everyone is starting to get mature plants that are producing inflorescence. And a lot of people are creating seedlings. So the market is absolutely flooded. If you've got rare anthuriums you were hoping to make like a profit on, sell them now because the prices are just bottoming out at this point. There's millions of seedlings on, not millions on the market, but there's so many on the market. Everyone's producing seedlings. I've got a few hundred, like everyone's got them. So the like Crystallinum, Magnificum, all those prices are gonna fall. However, the big trend I think is gonna be hybrids. That's like the new thing. If you're on Instagram and you follow any like bigger Instagram people or whatever, they're all trying to breed stuff. They're all trying to cross things. So I think this is really cool actually is we're gonna find a lot of interesting hybrids starting to come. Instead of just like 20 like big breeders from like 30 years ago who make amazing stuff, we're gonna have like a hundred thousand, maybe not a hundred thousand, but thousands of like amateurs just crossing plants and just by sheer numbers alone, we're gonna get some amazing hybrids in my opinion. And that is gonna be the next market from what I can see. Even like philodendron, a lot of people are trying to cross stuff. They're learning about it. We're talking like, this is a very interesting time in like plant history, I would say, because you have thousands and thousands of people now trying to breed their plants that they like got to a mature size. And so we're gonna have some radically cool hybrids, I think. It used to be there was only a few breeders out there like coming up with cool stuff, but now, it's like the monkeys on typewriters, you know, after a while, they're going to write a novel, you know, <laughs> there's just a lot of monkeys and me included trying to grow in Ethereum. And eventually some people are going to get lucky with really cool hybrids. So I'm excited for that because the hybrids are really cool. And that's something I really want to make. So I think that's like the, that's the big trend now is going to be these random hybrids because for the most part, everything's saturated. I mean, you're going to still have your like rare random one off trends, but I think that's a big one. So the hybrids is gonna be like the new thing, like showing off your cool rare hybrid, because those are gonna be truly unique for the most part. You're not gonna have, like, there are, in in my opinion, there's very few unique plants out there anymore. I mean, they're all, there's like 100,000 of like everything. There, there's no, there's not many rare plants anymore. So I think the hybrids, that's where it's at. Um, do you measure or adjust pH when watering? No, I should. I've got really high, uh, like high acid water, so I should really look into it a little more, but. I haven't had the time. It's just, there's a million aspects for plant care and that's just one I haven't gotten to. Eventually I will, but no, I have not. Um, oh, and they, the next part of the question is on the next page. They wonder if it makes a big difference. It does. I mean, there's a lot of plants where the, the pH matters a lot and you can get such better growth if you pay attention to it. The star players out there, they're paying attention to it or they're getting lucky because their water happens to be like in the right range. It matters. I mean, pH, pH is a big deal. I just, my water is good enough. It's not killing things. So what can I do? All right, next one. Can you do a comprehensive video care or video on orchid care? Uh, I don't really have a very vast bit of knowledge on care. Like I said, I have a shoebox of dead orchid tags, so I'm not a professional at any point. As I do more experience or experiments and learn more about them, I'll definitely make some care videos. But at this point, there's a lot. There's many other better growers out there that can give you way better tips based on their experience. I would I would seek out orchid care from somebody else for now. I'm I'm, I'm not good enough at it. I'm I'm killing them and I'm not I'm just not good. Um, how old are you and do you live thanks to YouTube? What's your dream? All right, those are three questions. I'm 31 at this point, so I'm, I'm getting pretty old. <laughs> Um, do I live thanks to YouTube? No, <laughs> YouTube does not earn enough money. <laughs> There's no way. I, I mean, it would be amazing, but if you live in America, just health insurance for your family alone, it, like that would eat this, eat all my YouTube earnings would be eaten up by that. So I, I don't foresee myself ever living off of YouTube because I don't make enough. And like, if you've seen my channel recently, there's, there's not a lot of views coming in. So <laughs> I'm not making a lot of money, but I still like it. 
Um, lastly, what is your dream? My biggest dream is to create cool hybrids. I would love to create a beautiful hybrid and then be able to name it after my wife. That would be like, that's my like go-to. I, I wanna name the most beautiful hybrid I create after my wife, and then I wanna make something kind of cool and name it after my son, and then finally, I might name something after myself. But I, I love the idea that you can create something beautiful from breeding plants and then you get the name. I think that's a really cool thing and that really draws me to plants as well. So that's my dream. Um, next, have you ever tried LECA? What do you think of it? I've tried it, it works pretty well. Sometimes I like root rot the very bottom stuff that's sitting in the, I don't know. I I haven't put enough time into it, but I think it's a very good way to grow plants. It's very like airy inside of there, it's nice. People have proved LECA works great in hydroponics. I mean, marijuana growers, vegetable growers, they've all been doing this for years and LECA works great. I mean, LECA is not a new thing. I know it's been like popular suddenly with aeroids, but it, people have been using it for a long time for plants and it works great. So I think, if you watch a lot of hydroponic videos, you can apply their like knowledge to aeroids pretty well. So yeah, I think it's good. I wanna get more into it. Um, have you ever tried using hydrogen peroxide to boost plant growth or prevent root rot and water propagations? Um, I've tried actually using it to like clean a rotted plant, but I haven't done it enough to really see if it works. So I, I don't know enough about that, sorry. Uh, where do you live? How does your climate and conditions, humidity affect your plants in the winter? I live in Wisconsin, so we have a horrible winter. Um, I think my wife regrets moving here because it's very cold. <laughs> but I guess South Korea is pretty cold too, so. Um, so it's pretty cold in the winter, it sucks. We don't get good light. That's why I'm like 100% artificial light. The humidity, I'm just spraying water to bring it up. I have it in a closed area, like part of my basement is kind of closed off so the humidity can build because my actual basement is probably 30% humidity in the winter. So in the room, it helps. So, it, I don't know, I, I the winter doesn't affect me anymore because I'm just 100% artificial light, so. But I have a whole video about winter and summer and it's important, I'm gonna make that for you guys too. But anyways, trying to make this less than an hour, which I don't see how it's possible, but how do you water or feed your plants when you're away somewhere? Um, usually I call my mom and I say, hey mama, it was easier when I lived at home because they could just be there. I don't know what I'm gonna do now, honestly, because I don't live with them anymore, but I'm gonna have to depend on them and either pay them or figure out a way to make them come here and take care of stuff. Uh, ideally, I'd like to automate things at least somewhat. Um, the biggest key, I think, if you're gonna go away somewhere with your plants is take them away from the light, all right? They're not gonna, don't water them too much first before you leave though, because if you don't, if you water them too much and you take them away from the light, they're gonna rot. But if you take plants that are just like, somewhat watered and you take them out of the really bright sunlight they're not going to need water for a while i mean that's a part of the one big video i want to make but the big ticket is if it's not sitting in the sun it's not going to be like respirating a lot and like losing its moisture so it can go for a long time i put plants in a box for a month as an experiment and they did pretty darn well i mean they're it's kind of hard to tell they were even in a box for a month so don't be afraid to put your plants in a darker area if you're going to be gone for three or four days they're not gonna die from no light and they're not gonna like dry out and die either. That's the big key. You know, light will make them dry out quicker. So I think if I leave, I'm gonna put my light cycles on something really low, maybe like five hours a day or something, and that will make them stay moist for a long time, you know? So that's the big key, I think, is your light management. But long term, I've gotta beg someone to take care of them. So that's what I would do, I guess. Um, a lot of these questions too can be made into full videos, which I might start doing because these are really good questions, but let's go to the next one. Where do you see yourself in five years in regards to your plant journey? Thanks, take care. Um, I would love to, like I said earlier, have a rare, not rare, but I guess a unique anthurium hybrid that I've created and name it after my wife. That's like my big dream. I think that's really cool. And uh, I just would like to do that. I just think it's cool. And then I would also like to have somewhat of a plant business, whether it's a side thing or a full-time thing with like plant care stuff and like how to really take care of plants well. And just, I wanna offer unique solutions for plant care, I guess. I think I like the physical aspect of that and like creating products. Like this 3D printer thing and the moss poles, I've got a lot of ideas for other stuff and just, there's a lot to do with that. So in five years time, I think I'll, I'll be somewhere because I'm pretty slow with things. And so I think five years gives me quite a bit of time. So that's kind of where I wanna be. Um, have you tried tissue culture or micropropagation techniques at home? I have not yet, I have the supplies, I really wanna get into it, but again, it's another whole study with the wife and the kid and job and everything else and just producing videos, it's tough to get to that kind of stuff. But eventually I will, I mean, I, I wanna try tissue culture. I think it's really cool and it's really the only way to grow orchid seeds and I would love to try and grow some orchid seeds. So that, eh, we'll see, uh, it might be another year from now, but I'm gonna get into it eventually. Um, how do you heal a plant that all of a sudden has transparent leaves? 
Um, I'm not really sure what this question is asking. There's a little bit more to it, but I'm not 100% sure. Anytime your plant is sick, try not to water it a lot. You know what I mean? As long as it's not drying out and dying. If plants are sick, they're not uptaking water and like using it properly. So that like raises your chance for root rot, right? Anything that causes plants to like not grow normally or like act normally, it's gonna significantly reduce their water uptake. And that is when you truly get root rot. It's like once the plant can't take up all that water, it starts to like sit in there and it doesn't dry out soon enough. And that's when it kind of goes bad. So if your plant is sick, give it like a medium sort of light, don't fry it, and don't give it too much water. Other than that, I don't know what else to really say. Sometimes when my plants are sick, I just chop them up and propagate them. That seems to be the ultimate reset button. Um, what's next? Do you have a produce garden or hydroponic setup? When I was younger, I had a hydroponic setup and I wanna start getting that set up here in this house now that I have more space. And I have a big garden in my backyard. Since I just moved in over this past year, I haven't had time to really make videos about it, but this next season, I plan on making a lot of more like outdoor garden videos. I think it's like equally as valuable as like rare house plants or house plants in general. So there'll be some more content about that. I love having my own vegetables. I mean, this year we had onions, so many onions. And we cook a lot of, like, we eat a lot of Korean food here and I'll get to that whole thing later, but we eat a lot of onions. So it's been amazing to just walk out to the garden, pluck some green onions, pluck the things I need, some peppers, whatever and some other like Korean vegetables and it's been awesome. I, I love it. It tastes so much better and it's better for you. So I think everyone should do it. I'll make videos about it. So yeah. Um, what else besides plants and tech are you interested in? I think I an answered that with my hobbies. I'm really, I'm interested in everything. I mean, I can find something cool about literally anything. I don't care. I, everything's awesome in my opinion. The, my problem is I don't have enough time for everything. That's like the biggest like Probably the saddest thing is like wanting to experience everything, but my time is limited. So I have to pick and choose. <laughs> so I answered kind of my hobbies earlier and I love all those things. So that's what I'm interested in. Um, water propagation for sphagnum moss for philodendron and pothos. I answered that one earlier. Water propagation works, but I think sphagnum moss is much better. Um, it just, it's more breathable. Some stuff is a little weird about being submerged in water and sphagnum moss gives you that good amount of humidity and moisture without totally suffocating it. So. I like that. Um, did you go to college? If so, what did you study? Uh, I failed a lot of stuff when I was younger. I didn't really care about school. Um, eventually, I just went to a tech school for web design for like a two year degree. And then I got lucky and I found a little job at a startup. And from there, it's been fine. And they taught me more like software engineering. So now I'm a software engineer, but I got lucky in life. Okay. I didn't do very well in school. Now I have an appreciation for education. So I would study well now, but I was a dumb young guy i guess i don't know so i don't really have a cool school history just i was kind of a an idiot who thought i knew better but i didn't so um next <laughs> which came first the chicken or the egg i'm pretty sure there's a lot of like uh, philosophical uh discussions about that and there's a lot of stuff on the internet about it i don't know i like eating both so <laughs> i don't really care which one came first um organic versus inorganic potting mixes which is better the debate rages on I don't know. I don't know which one is better. And I've never really paid that much attention to it. I think maybe if you're growing food for consumption or plants for consumption, maybe you want to try organic. I think that's probably the cleaner, safer bet. But I mean, I don't know how much time I've never looked into this. I, I don't know. I think for house plants, I don't really care. Whatever's going to make them grow well is what I'm going to use because I'm not eating them. And I don't think there's anything so toxic in that um, unorganic soil that it's like poisoning the air around me, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Like I said, never looked into it. That's probably a good thing to look into, but unless you're consuming it, I don't think it matters too much. Um, what's next? Pest management for carnivorous plants. Um, it's kind of tough. I've used neem oil on carnivorous plants. Luckily, they're pretty small, so you can kind of hand deal with the aphids. I found that mostly like aphids and stuff, they are after the flower stalks, um, and that's about it. Uh, spider mites don't really like super humid conditions, so I kind of keep mine in humidity domes and maybe that helps me, I don't know. I haven't really had a problem with pests on carnivorous plants. For whatever reason, they don't like it too much. I did once, neem oil, didn't kill the plants, seemed to work fine. But I did flush them afterwards pretty well, so I don't know. Um, what's next? Why do you like to experiment so much? I kind of answered that earlier. I love to see the whole process and I like personally compiling it and then I can share with other people and like, here's proof, this worked for me. Here's how I did it and it worked. Like, I think that's cool. I like that concept. I like sharing information. It's important to me. So I, that's why I like to experiment. And I, like I said, I have like no trust for like, I don't know how to describe it, but I like to see it myself. I like to experience it myself and that's the best way to do it. 
Um, how to properly take, take care of anthuriums? Honestly, I'd like to ask somebody else that question. I'm starting to get the hang of it. You know, they like, from what I've found, they like frequent waterings, but they like to dry out as well. Not totally, but like, I, I don't, I haven't found any that really just like to be wet. You know, it, it, I'm on like kind of a quick cycle where I water them almost every day, but by the time the next day rolls around and I'm about to water them again, they're pretty dry. So I keep them in a real airy soil and it seems to work pretty good. I can make more videos about that in the future. That's pretty much it for the plant questions. Now, if I have time, I don't know how much is left on this memory card. Six minutes. Uh, the whole Korea thing, I know you've seen t-shirts and food and I've mentioned it before. A long time ago, I met this girl at my church. She was Korean. We did a language exchange. I kind of showed her cool American stuff. I took her to a gun range, hiking, American barbecues. I tried to really give her the American experience. Um, we did a language exchange, like I was saying, so she wanted to learn English more and I just thought Korean was pretty interesting. So, okay, I started learning that. Um, she eventually went back to Korea, invited me to live with her sister. She had like an extra bedroom. So it was like a free, free trip for the most part. I didn't have to pay accommodation. So I quit my job because it was at a startup and I just wasn't very happy there for a little while. Quit or no, actually that's not how it went. First I had, I threatened to quit so I could get a remote work thing. So I used two weeks of vacation and two weeks remote work. So <laughs> I didn't quit just yet. So I was there for a whole month. It was so awesome. I loved it. Um, the, the girl I was living with, she was teaching English because she had lived, she also lived here. So this is the older sister, lived in the US for a while and went to school here. So she wasn't working full time. So we like went everywhere, you know? Um, before that, I also like, again, because the language exchange, I got some pen pals. I'm trying to make this quick because it's confusing, long story. So I had two Korean pen pals at this point. And so then I was able to meet them while I was in Korea. And there was more people from my church that moved from back from the US to the Korea. So like every time I went, it was like playtime there. I had friends there. I had a lot to do. I had a place to stay. Eventually the one pen pal became my girlfriend for a while. Um, like I think we dated for three years before now that we're married or maybe four years. I don't know, but it kept kept me coming back. So like every, <laughs> every year that I kept quitting my job, I'd earn some money. I lived at home, so it was easy. Quit my job, go spend like two or three months in Korea, hang out with my girlfriend, see her, see my friends and just have a, awesome time see some other countries around there so just ever since like the language exchange at the church again like i said i'm kind of an, an extremist like once i find something that's semi-interesting i really dive into it so i really just dived into the whole korean culture thing and now i've got a wife and a half korean child and it's pretty cool like i i love the fact that i'm like permanently tied to korea at this point i love going there i hope one day we can actually live there for a while i know my wife would like to live there for a while because <laughs> she prefers korea to america at this point because in wisconsin it's not that exciting so i get it but yeah i've just been like tied to korea this for like the past like five or six years all from just a language exchange at a church that i at my church that i did so it's been a wild experience it really changed my life um and I'm always grateful to everyone in Korea that showed me such hospitality. Again, it was crazy that they just let me come live with them for a while. You know, like I just showed up and lived in their house for a, a month. And then after that, a few more months, eventually I lived with my girlfriend and her family. So it's it's been crazy. But yeah, that's why I have like this affinity for Korea. I'm growing a lot of Korean vegetables. My wife, obviously, who was my girlfriend at the time, is Korean. So yeah, I don't know. I guess that's the story behind that. But it's been awesome and I can't wait to go back. Uh, I guess I got to end this at this point. I hope you guys enjoyed this long question and answer. If you made it to, this, to the end of this, I am amazed because it's been so long. I think we're at an hour and 15 minutes about. I appreciate you listening to my rambling. I hope I didn't talk too fast. But again, there was a lot to pack into this video. And I, if, if it was too long, I'm sorry. But there was a lot of questions and I like to really explain them. So thanks for sticking to, sticking with me guys i appreciate everything you guys do on this channel all the interactions i love the stories love the comments love the suggestions everything's great always feel free to reach out to me on instagram and the dms i try and answer everybody so as long as i physically can i try so thanks for all the years i really really love this channel and i love all of you guys and all the interactions so i appreciate it and as always may your plants grow strong and healthy i'll see you next time